What well, beautiful, beautiful music this morning. <clears throat> uh, they asked me to get up there and sing with them, but my throat was a little scratchy, so I didn't do it. Yeah, thank you. God bless you. Uh, hey, let's turn our Bibles to Philippians chapter 1. Philippians chapter 1. Uh, a way that I learned how to find it in your Bible is General Electric Power Company. Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians is too far. Back up one block. So General Electric Power Company. Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians chapter 1. I'm going to look at verse 1 and 2. I, I love that picture. Starting a new series now. And we're going to go all the way through uh, Paul's letter to the church at Philippi. I'm going to be hanging out with him for a while. And the theme of it is going to be finding joy in fellowship. Uh, if you have fellowship intimately with God and with others, then you have joy in your life. And so we, uh, we desire to do that. We desire to be closer to God and closer to others. Now, Philippians is one of uh, the four prison letters. Uh, Paul wrote Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, and Philemon while he was under house arrest in Rome. Uh, Philippians was written around the, uh, his, his, at the end of his first Roman imprisonment, uh, around A.D. 61 or 62 uh, is when Paul wrote this, this letter. Uh, Philippi was located in the northeast corner of what is modern-day Greece. Uh, it was part of Macedonia. And the city lay on the main road through Europe. Uh, now, the majority of residents there in Philippi uh, were mostly Romans and Greeks, and there were very few Jews living in Philippi. Now, we looked at it in Acts chapter 16 on Wednesday night that Paul had desired to go to Asia. And twice he tried to make his way over that way, but then God says, no, I don't want you to go there. Uh, he told him, I'm, I'm working over here in Macedonia. So he sent Paul a vision of a Macedonian man, and then the guy said, hey, come over here and help us out. And so Paul said, let me go where God is at work. So he adjusted his life. He found out that God was working in Philippi, so then he adjusted his life, and he joined God in the work that he was doing over there. So he wanted Asia, but God gave him Macedonia. And we got to do the same thing. we got to say, God, where are you at work, and let me adjust my life to join you where you are, and not just simply say, these are my dreams, and I want to go where I want to go. Well, the church in Philippi was the first church ever founded on European soil. Uh, it was founded on Paul's second missionary journey. Uh, he had broken off fellowship. Remember, he was with Barnabas and John Mark, but John Mark didn't really hang in there like Paul wanted him to, so they broke off. And Paul said, you take him with you. I'm going to take Silas with me. So he's on his second missionary journey. And Acts chapter 16 records the start of this amazing church with three notable conversions there. Uh, in that chapter, we see that uh, in Philippi, salvation came to a provider of garments. Lydia, who was from Thyatira, uh, she sold and made garments. Uh, she was the first convert in Philippi, and then even her whole household got saved. Which reminds me of what we just talked about last week. We use the excuse that we can't witness to our family and friends. Well, she did, and the whole house got saved. And so there's no reason why we can't do it. And in fact, what she did was she begged Paul and said, Hey, Paul, would you stick him out a little while longer? And would you mentor us? Because we really don't know how to serve the same God that you just introduced us to, so help us out. So there, Paul stuck around for a little while. As he did, salvation also came to a possessed girl. She was harassing Paul and Silas. And so Paul, he got upset and he cast the demon out of her. Well, when her... Her uh, masters found out that she had, they had done that, and they could no longer make a profit uh, out of her. They got mad at Paul and Silas. And they stirred up the whole town against them. They beat them up and threw them in prison. And it is there that our third notable conversion takes place, where this time salvation came to a prison guard. Paul and Silas were locked up in the prison. They were chained like common dogs in the inner sanctuary of the prison, the inner, inner room. And there, in the midnight hour, they were having a jailhouse rock. Now, Betty, I don't know if Elvis was there or not, but they were sure having fun there. And the Holy Spirit showed up, and the chains fell off of them, and all the doors opened up. And when the prison guard found out this had happened, he was about to kill himself. Because they said that if, if your uh, uh, prisoner gets away, then we're going to kill you. So he was afraid. He thought, oh, everybody escaped. So he's about to kill himself. And then Paul cries out, hey, don't do it. 
We're all still in here. Well, it's one thing for Paul and Silas to be hanging out in there, but here's the thing that overwhelmed me, was that all the other prisoners were still in there. You say, why in the world would they do that and not take off? I believe they heard what Paul and Silas were saying, and they said, we want to hear the end of that story. And so they want to stick around for a little while longer. So then the man asked the most important question you ever ask in your life, what must I do to be saved? And they said, I'm glad you asked. I got the answer for you. And they told him, if you repent and believe on Jesus, you'll get saved. And so and not only did he get saved, but wait a minute now, his whole household got saved. And so you can witness to your family and your friends. Well, it's been some tw- 10 or 12 years now since Acts 16 to Paul's uh, writing of this letter to Philippi. And Paul writes this beautiful letter, and he sends it by way of their pastor, Epaphroditus, who we'll find more about in chapter 2. Now, Philippians is known as the epistle or the letter of joy because Paul mentions the word joy in its various forms some 16 times in these four short chapters. The church at Philippi is facing life's challenges. However, Paul encourages them throughout his letter that their circumstances do not have to rob them of their joy. Just because you're facing hard times does not mean you have to let those times make you hard. You can still have joy, even in the midst of difficult circumstances. Remember, Paul's writing this letter from a Roman prison. So with that in mind, let's begin to study this great letter. Now, speaking on this subject, greetings from Rome. Greetings from Rome, Philippians chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. Let's stand together all over the building. As we honor and reverence the reading of God's perfect word. Philippians chapter 1, reading verses 1 and 2. You follow along as I read because this now is God's holy word. Paul and Timothy, bond servants of Christ Jesus, to all the saints in Christ Jesus who are in Philippi, including the overseers and deacons, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's pray together. Would your head is bowed, your eyes closed? Would you even now begin to ask God to speak into your life? Maybe you need to hear a word of encouragement, a word of joy today. Maybe you just want to celebrate that Jesus loves us. And he died for us and wants a relationship with us. Well, perhaps you know somebody going through a trial right now. We certainly think about those two terrible shootings. And would you lift them up to the Lord now? Father, in Jesus' name, we thank you for the wonderful songs that we have sung and how you stirred our heart today with fellowship and with worship already. And Lord, like Lauren Daigle, we have to cry out, how can it be, even though we know how to explain it from our Bibles, but why you would love us and care for us and desire a relationship with us still overwhelms us to this day. And Lord, we pray you'd help us to never get over that wonderful truth. And Lord, even as we celebrate you here this morning, we are mindful that there are those hurting and two more terrible mass shootings and countless other uh, trials have faced many people. And Lord, we pray that you minister as only you can. Uh, Help us, Lord, to find joy in fellowship with you and with each other. Speak to us, and we will obey. Of course, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you. Maybe seated. Well, Jerry, if I talk a little faster when I've been talking, I can get through both these verses today. We begin with the situation of the saints. The situation of the saints. And there's two different groups here. We start out with the saints in prison. The saints in prison. Notice their detainment there in verse 1. It says, Paul and Timothy, bond servants of Christ. Jesus. Now, I've already mentioned that Paul is writing this letter while under house arrest in Rome. Now, he's chained to two rough and rugged Roman uh, soldiers, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. So Paul has absolutely no freedom whatsoever. It wasn't one of these country club prisons that we kind of see today. Uh, He is there with these hardcore Roman prisoners. And they're chained to him, so he has no freedom. It's not like he's in his own cell, and they're off just outside watching him. So picture that in your mind, and imagine what that must be like. Here's the Apostle Paul. 
And he's writing this letter as he was writing the other three prison letters. And he's talking to Timothy and others that are coming in and out. He's praying and he's doing the usual things that a, a minister would do. And these two guys are looking over his shoulder and they're rotated out. Uh, so there's different ones coming and going throughout the day and throughout the week. And yet these guys, they're looking over Paul's shoulder. They're watching him write this letter. They're hearing him pray. They're hearing his conversation with Timothy. They're hearing all of these things. And Paul does not have any freedom whatsoever. No privacy at all. Everything he does, they see. But God uses that, as we'll see later on, and folks were getting saved as a result of Paul's imprisonment. But not only is Paul there in prison, but he says in Timothy. Now, Timothy is a free man. He is coming and going on his own free will, but he's putting himself at risk by associating with Paul. And out of his love for Paul and his loyalty to him, he is hanging out with the Apostle Paul. And he's there every day ministering alongside of Paul. Thank God for the Timothys of the world that stick by you even in the difficult times in your life. They don't just say, hey, you got some troubles? I'll catch you on the other side. Uh, no, he's hanging out with them. Well, well why were they detained? It's because of their decision there in verse 1. He says, bond servants of Christ Jesus. That word bond servants, it means, it's a, it's a Greek word doulos, and it means a slave. It pictures someone who has voluntarily and fully submitted himself to another out of love. And so it's not that Jesus made them slaves. They willingly submitted themselves to God out of their love and overwhelming gratitude for what God had done in their life. This word is used 30 times in Paul's letters. Paul was a big shot, yet he was still small. To put it another way, he was a very important man, yet he remained humble. This is the guy that led most of the church to faith in Christ. This is the guy that was going all over the place, starting churches everywhere. This is the guy who wrote two-thirds of the New Testament. This is the guy who was the great apostle Paul who would speak to just about everybody he came across with the gospel message. And yet Paul was an important man, and he was still a very humble man. Sometimes we have uh, people who think they're big shots when they're just little squirts. John Phillips put it this way. He says, he, Paul, was the Lord's property, entirely at his disposal. Paul was a man whose will had been mastered, whose heart was engaged, and whose mind was enslaved to Jesus Christ. Wow. Paul understood the great truth that the Christian has no rights at all. We have surrendered all of our rights and our will and our agenda to God when we got saved. Satan has deceived too many into believing uh, that a sold-out life to Jesus is a wasted life, but a miserable life. But listen now, a surrendered life is a satisfying life. Paul said he had learned the secret of being content. In all situations. He wasn't satisfied where he was. He says, I want more of Jesus in my life. He said, I'm not there yet. I'm doing the best I can to get there. And he was pressing on to become more like Jesus. Have you discovered that great truth? Are you fully surrendered to Jesus right now? Are you a good servant? You say, Pastor John, how can I tell if I'm a good servant or not? How do you respond when you're treated like one? Are you willing to do the menial tasks that nobody else will do? And so Paul says, hey, I'm not just the preacher. I'm not just the evangelist. I'm not just a church starter. He would do the menial tasks that nobody else would do. And that's why he could say, hey, just follow my example. What you see me doing, do the same thing. He never asked anybody to do anything that he himself didn't do. And he called on them over and over again to verify that, that he was speaking from the truth. And so remember, God is not going to force anybody to live under his lordship. We must decide to live fully for him. And remember, judgment day is coming, so we need to live our life now so that when we get to the other side, we'll be happy that we made these choices on the other side. Well, it's not only the saints in prison, but what about the saints in Philippi? Notice the saints in Philippi. 
So he says, to all the saints in Christ Jesus who are in Philippi. They were both strategically located and spiritually located. Being in Philippi gave them many open doors to reach many people for Christ. Now, I've already told you it was one of the most important cities in Macedonia. That gave them the open doors to have an opportunity to witness to people. But being in Christ Jesus allowed them to walk through those open doors. We need to live for Christ right where we are. And so if Paul was writing to us, he would say, to the saints who are in Christ Jesus, who are in Eustace, Florida. And we need to be in Christ no matter what city we live in. Well, notice the laity there in verse 1. He says, to all the saints in Christ Jesus who are in Philippi. To all the saints. Paul is writing under divine inspiration to the entire church. He speaks to everybody. Now, he's going to call out a few names, a few people by name later on, but he's speaking to the entire church there in Philippi. God knows us. He loves us. And listen now, he has a word in season for each and every one of us. Sometimes somebody comes to me after the service and say, well, Pastor John, have you been checking out my Facebook this week? Uh, have you been talking to somebody about me? Because, I mean, you are really just hitting me right between the eyes. Uh, let, me, let me take the pressure off of me. That was the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit knows exactly what you need to hear. And you might get something out of the message that somebody else didn't get out of it. They say, well, this really spoke to me over in this part of the message. And God knows exactly what you need, and he is going to speak directly to you if you have ears to hear and listen to him. And so he says, I'm writing to all the saints there in Philippi. Not just a few, not just the leadership, everybody. Now notice that word saints. It's been taken out of context by some denominations into thinking that that is something special that you can achieve sainthood. It's the Greek word hagios, and it means holy. It speaks about those who are set apart by God and are called to live differently. You do realize that we are called to live different lives in the world. And he's going to remind them later on that our citizenship is not even really down here. It's in heaven. So don't forget where you're headed to. It doesn't matter where you came from. It's where you're going. And so it, you, it was used more than any other word in the New Testament to describe believers. Uh, occurring over 60 times in the New Testament. Now listen, every true Christian is a saint. You say, I know some folks who don't act like one. <laughs> hey, they ought to. Because God has called us and equipped us and commanded us to live separately, to live holy, pure lives. He said, I am holy, therefore you must be holy as well. And he allows us to do that because the Holy Spirit is living in us, guiding us. So it says there, all the saints who are in Philippi, who are in Christ Jesus. In Christ Jesus, speaks about our spiritual union with Jesus. We are placed in Christ Jesus the very moment that we repent of our sins and trust in Jesus Christ to be our personal Lord and Savior. Now, we are saints, or we are holy, only because we are in Christ Jesus. If we're not in Christ Jesus, it doesn't matter what town we're in. It is Jesus who makes us holy. He alone is the source of all of our holiness. And he expects us to live holy for him, no matter what city we're in. Now, listen, Jesus has placed us here just as he placed those folks in Philippi, and he demands that we radically transform this town around us by the power of God. So he has called us to reach out to everybody all around us. At your work, God wants you to be holy and set apart. So people ask you a question. Why are you so different? You say, I'm glad you asked that question because Jesus Christ changed my life. Let me tell you how he can change your life too. And we have to live different. In your family, God wants you there to live different. So that they might see Christ in you and be inspired to come to know the God you say you serve. Uh, wherever you go, God placed you there and he wants you there. We have to be on mission with him everywhere we go. Well, after addressing the laity, uh, Paul then speaks to the leadership of the church. Look at verse 1. It says, including the overseers and the deacons. Including, or as the King James used the word with, uh, although Paul mentions the laity and the leadership Separately, 
This does not mean that the pastor and the deacons are more important than the rest of the church. Uh, like the role of a husband and wife, it's about a function and calling that has nothing to do with worth. One is not worth more than the other. God has no respect of persons. It's just simply a matter of his calling and his function on individuals. Now he says the overseers. The King James used the word bishop. It means, it's the Greek word episkopos, and it means a superintendent. It speaks of a Christian officer in general charge of a church. Bishop, overseer, shepherd, and pastor are all interchangeable terms to refer to what we call the pastor. The pastor is God's man placed in the local church to care for the spiritual matters of that church. What he does, he cares for and he feeds the flock. Now Paul, when he was leaving the church at Ephesus, where he had spent three and a half years as their pastor, in Acts chapter 20, verse 28, he calls the leadership together. And he gives them a warning. And he says, be on guard for yourselves and for all the flock, among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers, there's that word, to shepherd the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. So what he's saying to the people there is, remember now the high cost that Jesus had to pay to bring these people into the flock, into the church, to make them Christians. And God has placed you over them, and so make sure that you feed them well and you lead them well, because you will give an account. Then he moves from the pastors to the deacons. He says, in the deacons. That's the Greek word diakonos, which means an attendant, a waiter, or a servant. Now he says, including the overseers and deacons. Notice that Paul mentions the pastor with the deacons together. This leadership team is also linked together in Acts chapter 6. We looked at that when we ordained Lewis. And in 1 Timothy chapter 3. The pastor is the spiritual leader of the church. He gets a vision and direction from God. And then the deacons then come alongside the pastor to carry out the vision that God has given to him. Now listen, when each one of us does our part, Christ is honored and the needs of the people are met. And thank God for the deacons that we have here in this church. Uh, I've been in churches where the deacons have spent more time working against you than working with you. And nothing got done. So thank God we have deacons in this church that we come alongside of each other. We have prayer time every morning. What a sweet time that is to pray with the deacons uh, before we start our service here every Sunday. Well, Paul moves from the situation of the saints to the salutation to the saints. So he says, here's the situation, we're in prison, and you guys are in Christ Jesus. And then he opens up with his usual salutation or greeting or his way of saying hello. He starts off with the provision for our salvation in verse 2. He says, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace to you. Paul starts the letter where he's going to end the letter. With grace. In chapter 4, verse 23, he says, The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. So he begins and he ends with grace. Now, grace is God's unmerited and undeserved favor bestowed upon those who are undeserving sinners. Without God's grace, we couldn't be saved. You can never do anything to earn God's salvation. It's by grace through faith that we are saved. Now, grace is not the same thing as mercy, but it's often linked with mercy. Uh, grace is getting what we don't deserve. Mercy is not getting what we do deserve. So God gave me this illustration a long time ago. Uh, let's say that John broke into my house and he was a thief. And, and I don't think that he would do that, but for the sake of argument today. He breaks into my house, but he's hungry. And he's desperate for food. And I catch him. Now justice will be to call the cops. And he's going to jail. He deserves it. He earned it because he broke the law. He went in someplace he wasn't supposed to go. And he violated the law. And so justice would be to call the cops, have them come and arrest him, and him go to jail. Mercy would be me saying, you know what, I'm not going to call the cops, but get out of here. Don't come back again. 
grace will be if I said, John, you're hungry. I'm not going to call the cops. I won't give you justice. I'm not only going to give you mercy by not calling the cops, but sit down. Let me prepare a meal for you. And let me get me some, some uh, maybe that meal we had this morning. And, and then let me get you some groceries and have some money go on your way. So what God says is that you deserve justice. What you deserve and what I'm fair and right and just and giving you is hell. You deserve to go to hell to pay the penalty for your crimes, for your sins, for all eternity. And suffer my wrath forever. That's what you deserve. Mercy would be to say, I'm not going to send you to hell. I'm just going to annihilate your soul. Uh, what the Mormons believe, soul annihilation. Uh, the uh, grace would be, not only am I not going to send you to hell, I'm going to allow you to come to heaven. Wow. Thank God that he doesn't give us justice. And thank God that he gives us more than mercy, but that we get grace as well. Because I don't want to just become worm food. I want to live with Jesus Christ forever and ever. And so Paul says, grace to you. Wow. So he says, grace to you. To all you saints there in Philippi, I want grace to be bestowed upon you. God's supply of grace never runs out. Do you realize that? I don't know if you're anything like me or not, but sometimes I mess up. And I don't always listen to God. I don't always live right, don't always do right. Uh, sometimes I, I break his law. And, and God says, well, I'm going to give you more grace upon grace. Not just a one-time thing, but I'm going to keep on giving you grace forever and forever and forever and forever. He is the God of second third, fourth, fifth, sixth chances, okay? And because God has poured out his grace upon us, an unending supply, listen now, we are to be dispensers of that same grace to others, an unending supply. You say, well, they don't deserve it. You got it. You don't either. Oh, well, they, they did this to me. Wait a minute now. Did they do something worse to you than what you did to God? Uh, well, you don't understand. I, I just don't like them. Yeah, well, get in fellowship with God and you'll be in fellowship with others. And, and so maybe God's saying, hey, there's somebody you need to pour out some grace upon today. And remember, the same grace that you're giving out, God gave it to you in a much greater measure. Wow. When, when Peter asked the question, how many times should I forgive the law says I ought to do it a couple times. Let me be real spiritual. Let me go seven times. I'll, I'll multiply it by three and I'll throw in one for good measure. And, and Jesus says, that's not enough. No, I'm saying to you, seven times 70. Uh, he wasn't saying, when you get to 490, 491, sorry, time's up. Uh, no, if you're really giving grace and forgiveness, you won't keep holding it up. Does God ever come to us and say, remember what you did about a month and a half ago? Mm -hmm. Thank God he doesn't. But we'd be there a long time if he talked to me about all my faults. So that's only possible when Jesus has full control over our lives. We're going to see later on in this chapter, Paul is preaching the gospel. Okay, He was a preacher of the gospel. He'd preach to a tree if he'd listen to him. And then he says in later on in chapter 1, oh, I'm not the only one preaching the gospel. There's some other folks preaching the gospel too, and there's two sets of them. One set of people, they're preaching the gospel, but they're really not concerned about seeing souls saved. They're really trying to cause me more problems. And we'll look at them in greater detail later on. And they said, but in the other group, they, they're preaching it, and they really do love me and care for me, so what I'm going to do, I'm not going to hold it against the ones that are preaching just to cause me more problems. I'm going to rejoice at the gospel going out and folks getting saved. Wow. So Paul didn't see competition between ministers. He said, as long as the gospel is going out, bless God, they get saved, why not? And so we're not in competition with anybody who serves the Lord. We'd all love to have them come here and hang out with us in our building. But as long as they go to church somewhere where they're hearing the gospel, thank God. Because there is no Seminole Springs Baptist Church in glory. There's only God's church. And so we're not in competition with anybody who is promoting the gospel. 
And so he says, grace to you. Well, there's the provision. What about the product of salvation? He says, and peace. And peace. Notice that Paul put peace after grace. And he is specific in doing so. Why is that? Because a lost person cannot experience the peace of God until he has first experienced the grace of God. The only one that can really experience God's peace is a Christian who has experienced God's grace. That's why only a believer can face life's toughest challenges with the calm assurance that God is in control and everything's going to be all right. Later on, Paul's going to say, I'm kind of at a dilemma here. Not really sure I'm going to get out of this prison or not. Uh, here's, here's the situation is that for me to live as Christ and to die is gain. He said, I, I really want to go on to be in glory. I'm not sure if we're going to get out of this prison or not. Uh, he says, it'd be better for you guys if I stick around because then I can keep on ministering to you. Uh, really, for my sake, I'd rather just go on to glory and hang out with Jesus. He's not sure what's going to happen, but I think that God's probably going to leave me down here to minister to you all. Uh, but he had a calm assurance and a peace because he had experienced God's grace. So he says, no matter what happens in this prison, I'm good either way. Live or die, doesn't matter. I'm good either way. Wow. And so as we pray for, for those families to experience the peace of God that went through that terrible tragedy, the reality is they cannot experience God's overwhelming peace unless they experience God's grace. Uh, they won't be able to handle the trial unless God comes and ministers in their life. And so we're really praying for them to get saved and draw near to God. And then he says, when, if that happens later on in chapter 4, he'll tell us that the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds. And so there's the provision, there's the product. And finally, we notice the providers of our salvation. So Paul says, in, in, uh, for, uh, grace in, to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. And notice that it says that this grace and this peace come from both God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. The two are inseparable. Because of what God has done for us, we should praise Him daily and remember that it's all about Him. And so I don't know if these songs stir your heart or not. They sure do mine. And I do ask the question, God, how can it be? You know where she might have got the thoughts for that question, for that, that song? Maybe she was thinking about David in Psalm 8. When he asked the question, what is man that you're mindful of him, the son of man that you care for him? Uh, who am I that you would love me and care for me? Wow. And it overwhelms me. And so as I think about the grace of God poured out upon me, not just on July 27th, 1997, uh, but every day in my life, all day, every day, even in the nighttime. I couldn't even get up this morning unless God allowed it to be so. Now, I could have a heart attack at any moment if God does not keep my heart beating. And so really, I need the grace of God every second of the day. I cannot get by one moment without Him helping me. And, and as you think about that, as you think what God did for you, you just can't help but be overwhelmed with gratitude and to humbly want to bow down and worship Him. And then as you think about how God good's been to you, then you start thinking, well, no matter what anybody else has done, but by the grace of God, there go I. And so I could have done the same thing that anybody else has done if God had not helped me to do so, not, not to do so. And so it's easy to look at people and say, well, I don't know how in the world somebody can go, possibly go into a place like that and screw people up. Well, they need the grace of God. And when they experience the grace of God, they have the peace of God, they won't go do stuff like that. And so we need to pray, God. And really, it's because folks are not out there sharing the gospel enough. Maybe if somebody had witnessed to him, he wouldn't have done that. So he says, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Wow. After concluding Beethoven's magnificent Ninth Symphony, Arturo Toscani brought down his baton. And the crowd began to roar and cheer and clap and celebrate and whistle. And they were just cheering him on. And, and then he took repeated bows along with his orchestra over and over again while they just kept cheering and celebrating and going on. Then as it died down, he turned back to his uh, orchestra. And he told him, gentlemen, I am nothing. Gentlemen, you are nothing. 
But Beethoven, Beethoven, he is everything, everything, everything. Can I tell you, dear sweet saints today, that I am nothing. You are nothing. But Jesus, he is everything, everything, everything. The question is, is Jesus your everything? Is Jesus the true ruler of your life? Do you have the peace of God in your life? Are you displaying the grace of God to others in your life? And listen, if they deserve it, you wouldn't have to give it to them. If we deserve grace, God wouldn't have to give it to us. It is given to those who don't deserve it. And it may be that some of the people in your life that are really mistreating you the most, they need you to be at your best, to give them the grace of God. There was a saying when I was in school teaching that the ones who ask for love in the worst ways are the ones who need it the most. And so it may be you say, I know somebody, they sure don't ask for it the right way. They are the ones who need it the most. And God gave it to us when we didn't deserve it. And we dare not withhold his grace and his peace. Paul is under house arrest. He has lost all freedom. Doesn't know what's going to happen to him. He's going to live or die. And yet he pens this letter and tells them, in the midst of all of this, God is faithful and he is in control. What trials are you going through in your life today? Who do you know that's going through a trial? And they desperately need to hear a word of encouragement, a word of hope. It's not only Paul was suffering, the saints there in Philippi were suffering too. And we'll look at their suffering later on. They needed encouragement. Epaphroditus, their pastor, he almost died. He was so faithful to the ministry. You know what he was doing? He was burning himself out for the cause of Christ. We got so many today in our church that are just pacing themselves. Here's a man who almost died laying it all on the line. And you know what he's worried about? He wasn't worried about his own life. He was burdened because the people there in Philippi were worried about him. Wow. You know what he was? He was more concerned about others than he was concerned about himself. Uh, Paul will deal with that issue in great detail in chapter 2. Where do you stand today? Is Jesus your everything? Is he the absolute boss and the final authority in every aspect of your life? Does he control your checkbook? Does he control your time? Does he have absolute freedom to move your calendar any way he wants it to move? Will you do the menial task that nobody else wants to do? Will you love the ones that nobody else wants to love? Paul radically turned the world upside down. Because he was sold out to God. And Timothy said, Paul, I could be anywhere, but I'm going to hang out here with you in the prison. Because he had great loyalty to Paul. And by the way, the testimony of Timothy, when Paul was introduced to him in Acts chapter 16, he says, who's this guy, Timothy? I've never met the guy. But the testimony of those that knew him to Paul, who was a stranger to him, was that he has a good reputation. God help us. And when somebody says, hey, I don't know that person, but you do, uh, what can you tell me about them? That they would say, I can tell you very good things about them. Wow. Let's stand for prayer. This altar is going to be wide open. There are so many people that are hurting all around us. Terrible tragedies. People in desperate need of an encouraging word. Will you be a dispenser of God's grace to take it to a world that is hurting? Father, in Jesus' name, we are so overwhelmed by your goodness. Uh, Lord, even as the song says, Come, Lord Jesus, come. We desperately need you. And Lord, we need you to come and reign in our lives that we might submit ourselves to you and that we might carry out your plan and your agenda, not ours. And Lord, would you help us to see ourselves as bond servants? Lord, that we will be small and that you would make us big. But Lord, we would never feel that we're too important to do any task in the church, that we never feel like we're too important to minister to anybody, that we never look down upon anybody at all. But with great humility and love for you and for others, we would see their needs as more important than our own. And Lord, would you please 
in Jesus' name, bring these ones who have faced these terrible tragedies into a right relationship with you. Then as they experience your grace, then you can share with them your peace. Father, help us all to call to be pleasing in your sight. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. God